Ames. Hi, everybody. Um, but the option of switching to a speaker view is in the upper right hand corner of my screen. And I'm going to switch to speaker view when Renee starts to talk because it will make her slides fill up the whole screen, which is what I, I want to be able to see them. Um, but I want to just give you a few updates on where we are as a collective uh, people right now and where we are as the office. So, as a collective people right now, Obviously, we are in great grief and hope this week. And um, I think I have switched from fear and grief to grief and hope in these last few days, just with the outpouring of good intentions and the quelching of some of the violence. And uh, I believe that that is uh, coming together in a way that will hopefully inspire some true long acting change. Where we are locally, and speaking really of the coronavirus as it relates to the office, I just want to give you two words today to think about when you're thinking about how are you going out in this world now, which has been closed to us pretty significantly for the last three months. Uh, I want you to think of the word fomites, which is I touch my cup and hand it to you. I've left some fomites on the cup. And you know what? you don't have to really worry about them. What you have to worry about is droplets. And the droplets from me talking to you as I hand you the cup and you're within six feet of me, that's what you have to worry about. So you want me to be wearing a mask if I'm actually capable of breathing near you. But if I've left my cup on the table and I walk away, you can pick it up without concern. The, diff the problem is when you're out in public, you don't know if I've just touched the cup and left it for you, <coughs> or if I've coughed the cup and on the cup and left it for you. So when I go out to the supermarket, I'm still wearing gloves or really be making uh, very, very sure I don't touch my face. And after I go through the store or wherever I am, I wash my hands. It's easier for me to just wear gloves. And when I'm out in public, I'm wearing a mask to keep from, uh, you know, my wearing a mask really cuts down my exposing you to my droplets. <clears throat> it does a moderate degree of protecting me from your droplets. So I so much appreciate that you're wearing a mask also. And with that in mind, thinking about the difference between fomites and droplets, I think now is the time when we can all feel fairly safe at sitting outside, outside's always better than inside because the circulating air is great, sitting six feet away from our dearly beloved friends whom we've missed seeing, and we can exchange plates knowing that they are people who would tell me, you know what, I sneezed as I was bringing these plates out to the patio. So I'm going to wash them again before we touch them. So I will not cough or sneeze and leave a cup for you. I will make sure I have not breathed on that cup and just left my fomites on it, which you don't have to be concerned about. And because of that greater freedom, we're going to be starting to see patients in the office on Tuesday, and you'll get an email newsletter from us on Monday about the specific precautions. But in general, if you show up here wearing a mask, everything's going to be explained to you as we go through it. And if you don't show up wearing a mask, we'll have one for you. So, okay, all that said, I get to sit back and join you in the audience because we get to hear from one of my favorite people, Renee Riley Adams, who I've known for years, if not decades, but I've been really pleased to be working with the last few years at Northwest Memory Center. I've learned a lot from you, Renee, and I'm looking forward to learning more from you now. So yeah, take well, the thank stage. You. Thank you very much, Deborah. And uh, I'm about to switch into my slideshow, but I wanted to just welcome all of you. And I'm so excited to be here and talk about something that just means the world to me uh, about motivation. So let me share my screen and get my slides and we will see where we go. Let's see. And now I get it to a better, sort of, sorry, little clunky here. 
Okay, here we go. So uh, originally Deborah asked me to um, do a talk about heart math, which I also really love, and brain games, which I have a more difficult relationship with. And I just, I wasn't feeling passionate about it. And so I thought, what do I feel passionate about? And this is really, as a health coach and a life coach and facilitator, this is really where my passion lies, motivating and supporting ourselves to make and sustain health changes. Like, how do we do that? Oops, uh-oh, let me just make sure, sorry. There we go. There we go. I wanted to introduce myself. Deborah already did a great job. Um, my name is Renee Riley, uh, Riley Adams, and a lot of people call me Rara. So I have the name as Coach Rara, which is for my initials, as you can see. Um, ah, sorry. There we go. So these are, this is some of my life. I do retreats with people. I used to lead um, a camp for kids through Rotary. Uh, I have two daughters, one of whom has graduated. And you can see I have changed during the COVID uh, era. I used to look like the top left photo with red hair. And now I look like this. I have, I'm sporting the uh, COVID gray look. And so I have all of these titles, health coach, life coach, et cetera, et cetera. And most recently, a new member of the gay, the gray tribe. Let's see. I'm, I want to move this. Deborah, can you see on my screen? Do you see the sharing or is it clear? Does it look fine? Everything looks fine. I've switched to gallery view, so it says speaker view up in the corner. And okay. you, what you are showing takes up the bulk of my screen. Okay, awesome. So many of you have heard uh, probably Dr. Deborah talk about the Bredesen protocol, and I was the health coach for the clinical study part of that, um, which was a wonderful uh, experience. And I still have a couple of patients who I'm coaching for that. Um, also, we have Karen Priskinis, who is also a wonderful uh, health coach. Many of you have probably run across her as well. So you'll know with the Bredesen Protocol that there is a pretty big checklist that is outlined in this book. There's the keto eating, keto flex eating, intermittent fasting, supplements, which I know Dr. Deborah prescribes uh, readily and um, is so well versed in what they all mean and what they do. Uh, exercise, brain games, sleep, of course, and relaxation. So it's quite a lot of things to keep track of. And as a health coach, it was my job really to encourage the patients to keep up with all of this and to learn more about them and each topic. Um, we could do a, top, top, a talk on each particular topic. And in fact, Dr. Deborah has done so. Uh, in the past. So many people would think, oh, this is incredible. It's my golden years. It's all going to be okay. Dr. Bredesen has figured out this way forward. And even if my parents before me had Alzheimer's or I have been exposed to watching that very difficult process occur and disease, um, it's all going to be okay. Maybe if I do what Dr. Bredesen says and exercise like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she has her own uh, book out on exercise. And as many of you may know, she's uh, 87 years old and she still does plank and uh, works out twice or three times a week, I think. Uh, maybe I, in my older age, I can go rowing with the master's rowing. I know Deborah is a rower and I have been a rower with her and my husband rows every day. Um, did before COVID and now people are getting back into singles on the water. And as I get older, maybe too, I can have the style of the queen at 94 and wear bright colors. 
Or I could be like Thomas More. This is a man who is a World War II veteran, and he decided he was going to raise money for the, the NHS, the National Health Service in the UK, by walking back and forth in his garden. I think he wanted to do a hundred lengths of his garden by his hundredth birthday. And then, of course, some of you may know, this is Ida Keeling, who is 104 and wrote a book called Can't Nothing Bring Me Down, Chasing Myself in the Race Against Time. She is a runner and she's broken several world records, even at 104. And then, of course, someone who I find extremely inspiring, though she is younger, much younger than 104, and that is our very own Dr. Deborah, who I know inspires many of you to be healthy at whatever age you are. So some people would think, okay, this is great. I've got the Bredesen book. I've read it. It is kind of hard to read, I found, but I made it through that. I'm going to do all these things. So what could possibly go wrong? Ugh, too much change. A lot of times people think they need to change everything all at once without first taking into account what they've already, what they already do well. And so I would encourage you as you make changes to focus on one change at a time so you don't end up looking like this or feeling like that. Also, what gets in the way I found with the people who I work with, patients and clients, um, is that their inner critic and their judgment gets in the way. So it's important to know what your inner critic is. Those are the voices that you may hear inside your head that are less than positive. That when you start and you wanna make a change, these voices may be saying, no, you shouldn't do that, don't try. So if you can characterize more about your inner critic and kind of get to know it and befriend it, that tends to help. I've heard people describe their inner critics like a Tasmanian devil. I just need to get really busy and start doing, doing, doing. I've heard people describe their inner critics like a bat. In fact, that's kind of how mine is. Just hovering just a little bit in my periphery, uh, feeling a little bit of dread, like I don't know when it's gonna strike. I've also had uh, different students, oops, different students who have had uh, kind of a, a different inner critic, Mr. Pillow, I remember one high school student, and Mr. Pillow for the student would say, you don't need to study, you don't need to change or do anything you're supposed to do, just come lie on me, Mr. Pillow, and it'll all be fine. So each of us does have an inner critic, and it's good to know what they are. My personal inner critic looks somewhat like this, big R. <laughs> and she is a little scary. So it's important to know what the tone of your inner critic is. So later on, you can befriend it. Mine is pretty much drill sergeant. And as you can see from the, the extended figure, finger is not very friendly. We also have a tendency when change occurs or when we want to make a change to go into survival mode. And this I talk about a lot with employees in terms of the lizard brain, so our amygdala, what tells us to fight or the fight or flight response. So this is the part of us that might think, ah, change, I, I'm too frightened, I, I need to get away or I need to fight this change and resist or simply get analysis paralysis and freeze or faint. In human defenses, all of this fight or flight tends to look a bit different. It looks more like attacking or avoiding, simply not seeing, putting on the blinders, or accommodating. I see so many uh, patients and clients do this. They say, yes, yes, I, I'm going to do this, and then nothing happens. Or they might deny. I know this one, uh, for me, my hands started hurting at one point, and it took me a good six weeks before I told my doctor that my hands were hurting because I was so afraid that what uh, the doctor was going to tell me was that, oh yeah, you have arthritis, there's nothing you can do about it, just get used to the pain. And so this is surprising, even as a health coach. 
We also have on the other side, as you can tell, the resourceful brain. And so this is really using our prefrontal cortex. And what it means is there's got to be a little space between the lizard brain. So you kind of take a step back and look at what is the situation here? What am I really trying to do? And what do I want to change? So that's really the part of ourselves that can manage ourselves. We manage our thoughts and our emotions and we're aware of our sensations, how our body is talking to us. And this can get us to a place of being accountable for ourselves and the changes that we make in our lives. It also can encourage us to be more resourceful and to reach out and be creative thinkers. So I always tell patients, especially when I've worked with them on the Bredesen protocol, we, we give them a binder and it has all the basics of the protocol in it and they do their tracking in the binder as well. And I always ask them to put a page on the front of the binder that represents what their motivation is. And so right now, if you have a pen and paper, I'd like you to tune into what your motivation might be for improving your health. So this could be what gets you up in the morning. Like, what are you excited to do? And you want to go forth and really live this life. It might be for you what connection you want to have during the day. I hear from a lot of people, they want to see their granddaughter graduate or they want to play with a, um, a new toddler and crawl around on the floor with them if they can still make it down onto the floor. That, that is one thing actually I found that it's important for me to keep moving, getting up and down off of the floor and even crawling around. So I have some sort of mobility and agility. So it's really, motivation is really about what excites you or inspires you. So I'm gonna give you just a minute or so to write down or to think about any, of, any way you can connect with your motivation. So I'll just give you a minute. And actually, if you want to write anything in the chat box, I think Rachel can see it or Dr. Deborah can see it. Um, and maybe you can tell me what some of those motivations are if either of you can see them. And they can be anonymous. I see you smiling, Deborah. Are you seeing any? <laughs> I would say that it's a, um, a nice thought that they could be anonymous, but we're going to get the name that's associated with oh, you. Okay. okay. So I'll, I'll just share mine. You know, I've never actually really thought of it, but I, I've, uh, there's a change I've tried to make this week, and I kind of think of what inspires me. And I, I came up with two words mm -hmm. and one of them was awe. I love the sense of awe mm -hmm. that can come with uh, seeing something new for the first time. And that could be a passage in a book or a view on the lake. But the other thing that really gets me going is a sense of mastery. What I'm very bad at is routine tasks. And if I can get something that's challenging and feel like I've done it well, or I've learned something, or I've put, I've connected a couple dots. Um, that's really exciting to me. So. Yeah. Well, that, that makes sense. I mean, I definitely see that in you and having watched you work with patients. Um, I always say that Dr. Deborah is kind of like a detective, a medical detective, and she gets in all the test results. And then for that particular person figures out what's next. Yeah. So keep in mind your motivation. And the other thing that does help is to practice positive self-talk. So this goes back to the inner critic. And I always recommend that people acknowledge their inner critic and that they befriend their inner critic. That they discover the positive intention 
behind their inner critic because our inner critics really want what's best for us. They just, they don't really keep up with how we're evolving. And sometimes old voices, maybe from a parent or a caregiver or previous friend or whatever, who was afraid of our growth, that that voice might still be in there saying, no, 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 don't, don't try that. I know for me, when I started my business as a um, life coach and a health coach, that it was pretty scary because um, previous to that, I had been living with my husband, who is an entrepreneur, and I had seen the ups and downs of it. And I'd heard the caution. And so I had a lot of voices that were like, eh, I don't know, it might be too difficult. But discovering that it's okay, I've got this, and I can cultivate and calm and integrate those voices and say, it's okay, inner critic, I hear you're looking out for me, but I got it. I can reflect and make the choices that are right for me. It's really, I, I think that um, a lot of the patients that I work for are, or I work with are usually over 50, many over 60, many over 70. And I encourage people to really honor and trust their own wisdom. You know, you've been living a long life and, to, and had a lot of experiences and um, hopefully a lot of learning within the time that you've been on earth. And my belief is that each one of my clients and patients and each one of you there is, or out out in video land right now is whole and competent and resourceful and has a wealth of experience to share and use for your foundation. Ultimately, though, the choice is yours, um, how you're going to relate to your health. Uh, I love this picture because you can see there's one woman on the left who is scared out of her wits and the other woman seems to be having quite a good time. And so these, both of them, they're both of their hearts are probably beating a little bit quicker. Uh, they both may have sweaty palms. You know, the body sensations are, are probably very similar, but they are making the choice. Is this totally terrifying or am I going to embrace it and go for it? So the choice is really yours, your relationship to the changes you make. Now, motivation can be from the outside or the inside, and I'm sure you've all heard of this before. It's extrinsic, which would be from the outside. This is uh, kind of what, um, what I think of like a salesman trying to make quota or a kid working for an A in high school. And also, whoops, sorry, also the fear of failure. Uh, that's a big one, and fear of punishment with um, this extrinsic motivation it can get people to do things but usually the changes don't stay so once the fear of punishment or the fear of failure is over it's not always sure that the change is going to stay and be sustained there's also of course the intrinsic so this is kind of the the carrot or the um the the stick in the extrinsic and the intrinsic is more what you were talking about dr deborah with the mastery and the awe it may be a curiosity or a love of learning or just that you know amazement that we all have these incredible bodies and minds and we get to learn and be in this world there are some other kinds of motivations, um, two other kinds that I've read about. One is called identified. That's where I know I need to change, but I'm not sure where to go. And that was definitely me with supplements. You can see those are my supplements on the right hand side on the table. And there are so many different systems of how to keep track of supplements. And it took me, gosh, many months, Dr. Deborah knows this because it was many conversations about supplements, whether to take them, which ones to take, how to systemize my, my process with them. I'm pleased to say that my process did involve a lot of colors and I got four sets of these little boxes. So I do it once a month. I've also seen with our patients, uh, one patient took a fishing box and turned it into an elaborate 
pill container. I've also seen what I call the cup method, which is just one single cup and once a day people put it in, you know, AM or PM. Those are the two cups. So there are many, many different ways to do this, but just knowing that it's okay not to know and that you will move forward and learn with others. The other is interjected. That's a type of motivation. And that's when we internalize outside pressure and end up feeling guilty. And recently I noticed this with my uh, ability to work out. So I, I, I felt a little drained every time I would think about uh, working out. I had just got it all together in terms of I had a class at the Y I was taking, water aerobics. I had a class at NIA dance I was doing. And then I just started doing um, high intensity interval training at the YMCA. And then whew, COVID hit. And so I didn't I didn't know what I was gonna do and I didn't have any weights at home. So it's been a process. I thought it needed to look a certain way. My exercise in order to do it right should look a certain way. And I really have learned to let that go. Um, I'll get into what I do later on. You'll see a funny video. But anyway, that's guilt can be a motivating factor and my personal experience of feeling guilty for long periods of time is that it depletes me of energy so if you are somebody who has this kind of motivation just understand that guilt can be a motivator and yeah and move along so really what we want to do is um, internalize motivation so we might have, we might begin with an external motivation, our doctor telling us we need to make a change or a spouse or a friend or culture. And then there may be some approval seeking as we go. Maybe I do need to chart things or go in and show my doctor. Actually, I've, I've showed my dentist, my dental hygienist, how many times I flossed between <laughs> one one uh, session, one appointment, and the next. And, you know, that definitely was approval seeking. But then it gives way to more understanding. What are the prices and payoffs of making this change? And it becomes a part of me, so I can really internalize it. And that's where the change can be sustained. It also helps, I think, to have a sense of your own character strengths and your values and to base, uh, to be in alignment with what changes you want to make. So here is, I don't know if any of you have seen this before, but this is from the um, VIA, um, I don't, there we go, the VIA Institute on Character. Uh, it's good to, this is a great site, it's called viacharacter.org, O-R-G, and this is Martin Seligman, who is at the University of Pennsylvania. He's called the, the father of positive psychology, and he and 55 other social scientists came up with these 24 uh, character strengths. And I've had my whole family figure out what their character strengths are. It's about a 20 minute online test that you can take. It's free. You do have to register, but you can unregister later. And for me, uh, knowing my top five values has really been important and it really underpins everything that I do in my life. So really, the question for me is how do I uh, stop being a victim in my circumstance, even if it has to do with health, and reframe my approach to change? So to turn things from a have to, oh, I have to take all these supplements, to a get to. How do I learn to do that? So with the patients who I work with, I find that motivation can take many forms. We've talked about the bigger yes, really knowing, oh, I do want to see my granddaughter graduate. I do want to be, I do want to be able to crawl around on the floor with my toddler grandchild or 
enjoy a sunset with my partner. There's also the alignment with values, as I mentioned before. I find these other things really help too, is being grateful that I even have a body, appreciating how much comes together, even just to have me open my eyes and put my feet on the floor every day when I get out of bed. And to have this growth mindset, so to see possibilities. I also learned that not knowing can be cool. This is a very coachy concept. I used to think I needed to know the answer to everything, but not knowing can really help with just being curious and having an open mind. And that helps with meaning and purpose. The other thing that I think has made a difference to the patients who I've seen uh, be successful at the Bredesen Protocol and at improving their health and making changes is the amount of support that people have. And I think too, it's not, um, it's not set in stone, the support you have. I know uh, I've been hearing from a lot of clients and patients who are living alone and, uh, and it's hard um, to not have that person who might be there for you all the time or not to be able to reach out to family and have them come and be with you. And yet people can reach out. And there's that sense of all of these things, you know, being accountable to myself. So managing my emotions and my thoughts, um, having compassion for myself, um, acceptance, that's really important. And then this is a big one, especially for me, I find self-love. Again, if I, it doesn't really involve punishment. The punishment and the judgment come from my inner critic. And it's really the self-love and acceptance that is still going to allow me to gently challenge myself and explore. You'll notice that both of these, um, motivation and support, are both um, helped along by curiosity, having an open mind. So let's just talk about self-management. Self-management can really help us go back to the basics. So there are five of them, and four of these are listed on this slide. I like to go back to what am I eating? Because how I'm fueling my body really does make a difference. And I love the talk that you give, Dr. Deborah, on uh, the Keto Flex diet. And I, when I started um, coaching patients on the Bredesen Protocol, I decided to try the Keto Flex diet myself. And I lost uh, 20 pounds, which was awesome. But more importantly to me than that, my knees stopped hurting. And that previous to that, I had gone to physical therapists because I thought something was wrong. And uh, I tried all kinds of things, but really it was when I started eating differently uh, that I noticed changes. Also in what we drink, um, it's so important. I used to see alcohol as a treat and a celebration, and I still do to a certain extent, um, but I noticed that I can make changes about what I drink in terms of celebratory uh, beverages. I now usually just take a um, martini glass, but I put one of those uh, bubbly waters in them, like bubbly or St. Croix or things that don't have artificial sweeteners in them. And I find that that actually I can kind of get myself into a celebratory mood with just that. The other thing about drinking is today. You yes. can get yourself into a celebratory mood turning <laughs> clockwise. Um, <laughs> nonetheless, I agree with you that we can be flexible and explore our ways to approach our habits with intaking liquids, but um, you could do it in a dark room. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do like joy and celebration. It is true. The other thing, and I just talked to a patient this morning about this, electrolytes, especially if you are considering doing the keto flex diet or you already have, a lot of times people get cramps. And so drinking electro electrolytes and drinking more water really helps. Um, sleep. Dr. Deborah is our queen of sleep, and I so appreciate it. She has counseled my husband, 
who has a difficult time sleeping. I do not. I fall asleep at the drop of a hat. Um, but I can see really living with someone like my husband who where sleep really affects his mood and his ability to see possibility. Sleep is so important. And there are wonderful books uh, out there about sleep. And then moving, as we've talked about exercise. The last one that I would add to that, I mean, of course, all of them are important. And you saw the list about the Bredesen protocol. There's supplements in there and brain games and relaxation techniques, which is what I wanted to add to those basic four, which is how do you stay calm and grounded? And especially at this point in time with the pandemic, uh, I want to give you a reference, and this is a guy I saw speak to a group of coaches the other day. He has a website where this is one of his very quick exercises, and it's called thestresscoach.com. And he has an app uh, that has lots of different guided meditations. But when I was on the call with him, he had us do this, and it took all of three minutes so to inhale deeply and hold for four seconds and to think I am warm and then to exhale and think I am calm. And then repeat that three times with your eyes closed or a soft gaze. I was amazed at how easy something so simple could make a difference. So of course, people have been looking at change and how we make changes for a long time. And um, this is one of the uh, therapies, Prashaska. Is that how you say it, Deborah? Do you know this guy? <laughs> okay. Well, this is J.O. Prashaska, Prashaska. And he had a big theory out there, um, the trans theoretical therapy. And it was in particularly helpful with addiction and people changing uh, those patterns. Um, I just wanted to go over it since it is one of the major theoretical ways that people change. He says there are five or six steps. The first one is pre-contemplation. So that's, I don't even know there's a problem. I'm unaware of it. I don't even know I want to change or think I need to. The next is contemplation. Oh yeah, I really should do something at home now that I'm not going to the Y. So hmm, maybe I should get that TRX that I can hang on the side of the door. Or maybe I'll get one of those very funny balls that people uh, talk about. They're only $15, so maybe if I wear my mask and go to Big Five. And this spills over into the preparation. I did go to Big Five where in Medford, where most of the people were not wearing masks, but there was tape on the floor to keep people six feet apart. And I bought my ball and I ordered my TRX. But still, preparation can take a while. I had to read the kind of big uh, poster that came with the ball and think about it some more before I actually took action. And now I'm doing a couple of those exercises, not every day, but more times in the week than I was before. So incorporating little by little these actions. And the last step, he says, is maintenance. So that's how am I going to keep this going? And it either results in relapse, which is I go back to my previous behaviors, or what he calls termination, which is actually a good thing. So the termination means I don't fall back into temptation. My temptation in my exercise routine would be simply not to exercise. I get so busy with my work and doing things, and so I really have to focus and see where it's going to fit into my day. So that's all a very grand theory in uh, change psychology. This is a very practical theory that I uh, use in my own life, and it's called the Universal Growth Principle. So the four A's, and maybe some of you have heard about them. The first one is awareness. So if I don't see what I want to do or I don't notice a problem, 
then I'm not going to do anything really to change it. The second one is acceptance. And that's where I get to see my dance with resistance. Like how many days is it going to take me before I actually put the pills in the little boxes and then end up taking them twice a day? I can be curious about that. And then taking the action and then adherence, which is the maintenance part of it. So it's very similar in terms of theories, but I just think this is much easier to remember. Um, Deborah, in looking at those, what do you think is the hardest step for you? For, <clears throat> I'd say for me personally, it's um, ad probably adherence. I'm a great beginner and then I get a little bored because I've been doing it for a week and so I'll try something new. So I'd say adherence, mm -hmm. um, which brings to my mind something that I just keep thinking <clears throat> Excuse me while you're talking about this. Um, can I digress for a minute? Digress, you go. <laughs> um, I, we've had meditation teacher at some of our presentations, and I encourage people to find somebody they like who uh, speaks during a meditation practice or guided meditation. And I really like um, the work of Sam Harris. And I'm doing his meditation series, which you're supposed to do daily. I think six months later, I'm on day 22. I have problems with adherence. But one of the things he says as he's guiding the meditation is he's, you know, you're going to pay attention to your in breath and your out breath, and it's going to be a really gentle attention. Don't alter your breath, you know, just pay attention. And when you find your mind wanders, just begin again. And one of the things I know from science is that if you're practicing meditation, that all sorts of nice things are happening in your body. And as your mind wanders, they kind of subside. And when you begin again, those healthful physiological changes rebound with vigor and you get even a bigger bang for beginning again you get more of a bang for that than the Dalai Lama does who just never strays from his clear goal of paying attention to his breath. So, you know, in a way I think that's, and I was talking to a patient this morning who um, says, oh my God, I, I lost my breath pattern. And I said, you know, no, but all you have to do is say, oh, I lost my breath pattern. I'm going to begin again. And know that you've just given yourself a real physiological embrace. So I think I'm going to think about that uh, with my adherence issues. So yeah, I love that. And I want to say bravo to you for doing 22 days. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> And I, I too, I've heard this about uh, meditation and experienced it myself. And the best metaphor that I have heard with meditation is if I start um, thinking about uh, thinking thoughts, really, which inevitably happens, um, think of it more like there are puppies in a box. And the puppies are just naturally going to get out of the box and try to stray. And you don't I, I wouldn't be very uh, aggressive with them and, you know, I, I would be gentle with them. I would, no, oh, here, puppy, come and, and be back in the box. And so it is that really gentle returning. And if you know you're going to get this, you know, beginner's mind extravaganza embrace, then why not? Yeah. I think that's also um, being creative about how you relax. So with heart math, there's that feedback. Um, there's a little thing you attach to your ear and you can see on your phone how long you've done it. Um, I prefer to relax in the hot tub and to close my mind and it's outside and I listen to the bird song and the frogs and that is my way of relaxing. So everyone has a different way and you will find your own way if, if that's a change you're wanting to welcome in. So I just want to go through each of these. I think we have time to do this and tell you a few things that I found uh, helpful 
in considering them. So this is a picture of my candle. And one of the things I do every morning is I take about an hour and a half, sometimes two hours to uh, write in my journal, to there's an animal spirit card I pick uh, and, and I read the news and I talk to my husband and it's a gentle start. So it's also a time when I remember my motivation and I have various things set up around my candle that remind me that I do want healthy relationships. I want playful spaciousness in my life. I want to savor things. I also have begun again tracking. At any given time, I'm usually tracking one thing or another. And this with the patients has really, I noticed, kept them aware of their own progress. And um, so tracking, writing something down uh, about, well, in the study, people would write down what they ate, what their ketone meter readings were, what exercises they did, those kinds of things. And there are apps that you can track just one thing a day, or I usually write out my tracking. I'm tracking my food right now and my ketones to see when are my ketones highest? Am I eating what I want to in order to produce ketones? And then a heart rate monitor, that helped me figure out what my heart is doing and how I can become more flexible and have a better range with my heart. Also the scale. Some people love the scale, some people hate it. I decided to put my scale away for two weeks and it drove me crazy because I, uh, in addition to thinking, oh, I'm putting on a few pounds, I also use my scale to notice when I feel like I may be feeling full or bloated but actually uh, the scale numbers are fine. So it, yeah, I really like the scale. It, it, and again, it's your relationship to that that will matter. And then let your network of support know what you're up to. So I say network of support, those are really the people who love you and care about what you're doing and care about what you wanna change and where you wanna go in your life. So it, uh, it may be a partner, it may be a family member, it may be a good friend. I, actually, it, it can even be a furry pet. It doesn't, as long as you're bringing what you want to do up and out of your own mind uh, by writing it down or speaking it, that really can help to give it a life of its own and its own moment, uh, momentum. So for acceptance, I think I told you that I, I bought my ball and I had to look quite a bit at diff, some of the different exercises and I checked it out with a trainer friend of mine, which would be good or not. So in this, in acceptance, I think it's important to be your own advocate and a cheerleader. Some people don't like cheerleaders and that's fine too. If you don't want to be a cheerleader, that's fine. But to speak kindly to yourself while you navigate and really know how to gently challenge yourself at the same time being compassionate and accepting. Uh, I put encouraging reminders all around my house. So these boxes that I had, I, I don't just leave them here. I put them on the way to my bedroom. And I go back and forth from the kitchen to my bedroom several times a day. And I'm like, oh, yeah, TRX. I also put it in my calendar when I'm going to um, exercise and then move it if I don't get to exercise when I think I'm going to. And also getting up and uh, out of the house. You know, a lot of people I work with walk and walking is so great. And I've added an extra walk in the evening with my husband. And it also does good things for my relationship. Also, I recommend practicing what went well. This comes from uh, Dr. Seligman, um, the father of positive psychology. And it's at the end of the day to share with someone or to write down or just to think about it, three things that went well during the day. They don't have to be big things, but this really helps your mind to connect those posi that positive circuitry and encourage yourself. So for action, 
uh, pre preparation, as we've seen, is really important. And even to the point of, so you can see in the picture there, I had these water bottles. That's what I was using for weights. So you want to put them, put wherever, whatever you're going to, whatever weights or whatever clothes you're going to wear when you exercise or whatever supplements you're going to take. You want to prepare and think, how can I make this easy for myself? taking small conscious steps. So everything adds up. Like Deborah, your 22 days, awesome. Keep going. Use it as a glass half full. And then get support for yourself and support others to take action. That's why exercise classes are easy, um, easier for a lot of people. Uh, let's see, I wanted to, <laughs> I made this video for my trainer. My husband took it. It's just 30 seconds long. I thought you'd get a kick out of it. Let's see if it'll play. Here Very I am. Very impressive. No. You two, can make it from the back. Well, two, two at once over your head. Yeah, I'll just do one over one now. Ready? Okay. Uh, uh, there we go. Stretch, stretch up. <laughs> no, no, not the empty hand, the full <laughs> hand. God, okay, okay, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> okay. So that exercise does not look like anything I ever thought I would do at the Y or in fact ever do in my life. It's brilliant though. These water jugs, I can take out, if they're too heavy, I can take out some of the water. I can add back some of the water and I have lifted those and put them on top of my car because I wanted to have some bicep stuff going on so I wouldn't be totally flabby at the end of COVID. Anyway, it's quite one. So again, back to adherence. How do you keep that spark alive? I recommend that people evaluate their plans. So again, this is how you stay in the driver's seat and um, don't become a victim to, oh, well, yeah, I just forgot about it. But also I have come across patients who want to evaluate like every week. And I think that can be very um, draining. To evaluate so often. So I recommend evaluating your plan of change, whatever it is, two to four times a year. And then use your energy, even guilt, to keep moving forward and to stay positive. And again, celebrate your wins and consistency with your network of support. The other thing is to stay conscious of red flags that may come up for you. And this is important. So you want to stay current with yourself. I, I do that every day as I write in my journal and just sit with what's going well. Uh, notice symptoms. Aha, what's, how, how do I know if I'm not on the right path? Well, for me, oops, I can go into overwhelm and fear and that shows up when my laundry piles get high. So this also can be difficult for me, but also for my partner. My husband does not like it when my laundry gets out of control. So when I see the piles, I know, okay, something's got to change. For me in the past, it has been also achy joints. And I've heard from quite a few people uh, that maybe they find out they need to change their eating patterns when they feel achiness or inflammation. Uh, lack of mobility, so maybe I need to go exercise, and just generally feeling stuck. So I'm wondering what your red flags are, and actually, Deborah, do you have one to share? What a red flag is for you? How do you know you're off track? I would say uh, overwhelm. Uh, that, you know, sometimes I'll, for instance, yesterday I had a lot to do and then I came into the office to be on that um, other Zoom a podcast, I think that I told you about her and everybody will see it next week in the newsletter. But I thought, oh my goodness, I have so much to do today before I get there. And, um, and I knew that if I stayed in that space, I'd just go to Facebook so that I wouldn't have to face what I had to do that day. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a terrible feeling because really uh, the day is long, our life is long, and it's really okay if I don't do something today and I move it over to the next day. So when I get stuck in that overwhelm, 
I shouldn't just rearrange my task. It's, it's a really good uh, reminder to, to look at everything, you know, what mm -hmm. am, am I hungry? Am I overfed? Am I under exercised? Am I underslept? You know, yeah. I think that would be mine. Yeah, that's great. And I, I, um, I like that you over what you uh, highlight overwhelm because I hear that a lot um, from myself and also from others and overwhelm is part of the fear family. So now whenever I find myself saying, oh, I feel so overwhelmed, I say, is there anything I'm afraid of? Because often it's linked to that. I'm afraid I'm not going to get everything done. I'm afraid I'm not going to. Um, yeah do something successfully or whatever. So I'm curious, Renee, do you mean your laundry pile literally or figuratively? Literally, it gets big. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look quite as big as that, but it's pretty big. Uh -huh, yeah. uh -huh. yeah. So good, good tangible. Okay, I'm almost done. Let's see, I think I'm gonna make time. So uh, let's see. The key thing is you get to improve your health. You're starting wherever you're starting and you know, you've lived this long and been able to appreciate life. And so in summary, connect with your motivation, get curious. Curiosity totally opens up things so we can notice and explore without judgment. Learn with your health care team. It's important, I think, to have a team. For a lot of people, this is a new idea, but I think it's a very important one to know that there are people who you can go to for support. And you want to prepare and also act. Take small conscious steps. And celebrate with your network of support, which on my 60th birthday, I did. My, um, my family created this uh, Zoom call. That's me at the bottom with the pink wig. And um, I got a 60th Zoom call. Oh, then that was Dr. Deborah in the phone call. So it was such a surprise. And I, it was during COVID. And I was supposed to be flying to Paris, actually, on my 60th birthday. But this was so, actually, it was I think much better than uh, what I had originally planned. And continue to ask the big questions. How is my relationship with my health? What do I wanna learn about next? We get to learn until we take our last breath. And who can I ask for support to keep myself accountable? So I, that's important, not to ask people to hold you accountable, but they can support you to keep yourself accountable. I don't know about you, but for me, I, I want to take responsibility and hold myself accountable. So um, sometimes I do get patients or clients who say, no, no, they want me to hold them accountable. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> you tell me what you want to do. Uh, you tell me when you want to do it by. And I'll ask you, you know, what can I say to you that would encourage you if you make your goal or if you don't make your goal? Because it's keeping going that really matters. So that's the end. Big question. What do you get to do with your health? And that's, yeah. That's, uh, thank you so much for listening. I'm going to stop sharing now. Uh, did I do it? Yeah. Can you? Oh, I think you're muted, Deborah. Right. I was, ha, nobody's going to mute me but myself. Isn't that true? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. It just no. reminded me. I, I've learned about those um, stages of change through a group of physicians I work with. And it's a good reminder to me because sometimes I'll have a lot more enthusiasm for somebody actually making a change when they, I really just help them enter the room of pre-contemplation. And uh, I need to sort of think, okay, this is pre-contemplation for you. You're not going to make any change here. You, you have to live there for a while. It may be a day, it may be a year and, right. and you know, that's and it's part of the process, yeah. So yeah. you don't have to have any judgment about it. I mean, that's what I find too, is people change when they're ready to change mm -hmm. and not before. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, thanks everybody for joining us. We'll be back here in two weeks and we're going to talk about a very controversial topic in two weeks. 
you'll see it in your newsletter. So I can hardly wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to be controversial. You'll have to join us. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank and, you so much. Uh, we'll uh, see you a little bit out and about with good social distancing and masked. We all have to learn to smile with our eyes, don't we? Because we can't count on our mouths to say, oh, I'm so glad to see you. Uh, so we're learning to smile with our eyes. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.